They talked about uh, the history of what I've worked on. I'm just going to go through the experience and motivation about why I'm talking. Um, you know, I did a lot of work on things that have been foundational, J2E, web services, um, Eclipse. I, I did stuff that, that uh, now would be considered an integration platform as a service. But the more interesting thing is I love teaching, and I teach every semester at Columbia University. I teach a master's senior class. And I've taught, I, I do it, I don't teach on things I know, I teach on things I want to learn. And so I've taught three courses the past three semesters on um, more modern techniques for building an uh, internet application. So when I was doing WebSeer, for instance, user interfaces were based on serverless, JSP, tag libraries, et cetera. Now it's all Angular JS. Um, we did WS Interop, SOAP. So I did a SOA course, you know, doing things like REST. Um, and this semester, I'm doing microservices, and we're using things like, uh, you know, Google Pub, Pub 7 Center. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about my experience. And what we've seen over and over again is that a concept emerges, it kind of gets traction, and then it, something else comes along and grows up into it, and then something else comes along and grows up into it. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but the fact that I did a lot of the prior generation, I'm trying to teach the current generation of both people and technology, it's given me an interesting perspective. Now, if you don't think what I'm saying is intellectually valuable, the other way to look at it is, I've made a lot of mistakes on the stuff that we did previously. And so it may just be the case that I'm up here as a demonstration of what not to do. Um, it could very well be the case that my sole purpose in life is to serve as an example for others, right? So, so uh, I'm not going to go through this, but this is kind of, this is a slide I used in class, you know, to explain to the students what SOA is. And it's pretty straightforward. Coarse-grained uh, services communicate via messaging as opposed to RPC or distributed object calls, loosely coupled. Um, you assume the APIs are going to go remote. Uh, the interface contracts are not typed like they are in Java. I mean, in Java, we always had this problem when we were doing RMI over IOP is the two different ends would have the, the different versions of the interface and you would get this, you know, incompatible class thing. Uh, it's around endpoints and they're discoverable. And all web services were, you know, is a standard for doing that. So it's pretty straightforward. So I took the class through this. And a little bit more, which will be kind of become uh, important as I go on, is if you notice, SOA says a lot about what goes on here and almost nothing about what happens on the service provider and consumer side. There is a clear distinction here. It's very precise about contracts, messages, endpoints, but it doesn't really say very much um, about how you actually implement the services. So then, having gone to parochial school, I looked up microservices. And it says the following things. Componentization via services, organized around business capabilities, products, not projects, Decentralized governance, infrastructure automation, design for failure, and evolutionary design. Very few of these actually apply to what it looks like from the outside. It's all about either how you build it on the inside or how you do continuous integration, continuous development, you know, constant release. It's more about how you do it, the internal architecture, as it is to the externals. With one exception, smart endpoints and dumb pipes. Um, I'm going to get back to this, but this one scares the bejesus out of me, and it's a really bad idea. Uh, and I'll kind of explain why I think that. So microservices and SOA, what's really changed? We've heard similar terms for those of us that are, are relatively old over and over again. Loose coupling, service discovery, asynchronous messaging, polyglot programming and persistence, you know, flexible scaling. We've heard this over and over again. It's been like a mad lib. I mean, when we were doing message-driven processing, 
we use a lot of these words. When we were doing, you know, Corba, we would use a lot of these words. Uh, when we did web services, what's really changed? And this came up, I remember vividly, whenever I would give a talk about web services, I would talk to customers and at first I'd brief them about message-driven processing. 18 months later, I would brief them about Corba and J2E. 18 months later, I'd brief them about web services. These guys are not stupid. The third time they go, uh, okay, Don, you know, I've heard this three times. What's different? And my answer typically was, this time we really mean it. We're not kidding. <laughs> if you can't take a joke, you should not be using our products. Um, but then I would take a step back and I would go, yeah, it's similar, but the, you know, it's an improvement. It's an incremental improvement. And if you think of the analogy that I gave was the ocean. It's not like you look at the ocean, it's low tide, you turn around, you come back and it's high tide, it comes in one wave at a time. And each wave advances it a little bit. And so microservices are advancing the state of the art, they are advancing. Um, so there is value here, but the key thing as we go forward is to make sure we don't lose you know, some of the things that we you know, managed to bring forward in an event that were good. I mean, you wanna get the good, but not, not uh, you wanna get the new, but not lose the good. So trying to teach the class at Columbia on microservices. I've come up with about a dozen observations on this technology, and I'm gonna go through three of them. And this came out of the very first project in the class. I gave the students a simple scenario, which is there are two microservices that pre-exist. There is a student info microservice that maintains basic information about students, obviously, what dorm are they in, how old are they, but there's a little bit of information about classes they've taken. This is not a separate resource in the REST sense. There's only one resource this thing manages, it's student, but inside a student there's information about uh, courses. And there's a separate uh, one which manages courses. So the only resource here is course, but there's a little bit of student in there because obviously it's not meaningful to talk about students without the courses they take or courses without the students they take. These are provided by third parties. Now you're gonna write them, but you're gonna pretend they're provided by third parties, and that means you cannot examine or modify the code. You can't go in and change the code. I want you to combine these into a single microservice that manages two resources, student and course, but any existing apps can still continue to call the old microservice, and I want you to have referential integrity between the two of them. So like if we delete a student, it's gotta come out of the course, or if we delete a course, it's gotta come, you know. So it seems pretty straightforward. I thought this was a layup. And what I wanted them to do, and the, I, so the mantra that I would give them is, I don't know how to do this, what do we do? The answer that I would give them is, if you don't know how to do something, what's the first question you ask? You Google how to do it on the web, because you're not the first person who's done this. <laughs> All right. And the second question is, if you don't know what to do, build a microservice. All right. When in doubt, build a microservice. So I wanted them to do is build two microservices, an API gateway. I wanted to teach them the API gateway and facade pattern. And I wanted them to build an event-based integrator. So in the facade, student and course would come in, it would get routed to the right place, so it looked like a microservice that did both resources, but if people talked to student, they could still do that, of course. And these would emit events, because when a student changed, I wanted to handle the event and go make the change in the course, I wanted to do this asynchronously, because uh, you know, this was an eventual, I was trying to teach them the concept of eventual consistency. When you change this, it can't call that and then wait and then get the answer in return because these were binaries and they didn't know about each other beforehand. This is unanticipated integration. So I was trying to teach them the event pattern. So it seemed pretty straightforward, but then I pretty quickly identified three issues. <clears throat> this is a slide, the references up here about the difference between so and microservices. It's pretty straightforward, I went through this, it's a pretty comprehensive list. 
But then I took a step back. And you can actually break these into four different groups of differences. The first difference is the dumb pipes versus ESB. This one, as I said, scares the heck out of me, and I'll get to that. Other ones in green are not actually different. If you were explaining SOA, you would have used exactly the same words. So to some extent, this is a misunderstanding of SOA. Sorry, those are the blue ones. The green ones, 100,000 lines of code, small services, you create a new service, um, you, op, you, know, you basically go and optimize them. These are statements about continuous integration, continuous development, how do you structure your teams, how do you do the build process, how do you bring the thing up. So in essence, the key difference here is microservices and SOA are quite similar. Most of the differences are not how they look from the outside, it's the development life cycle and how you think about the code that you write. And SOA intentionally never said anything about that, because it was always meant to be opaque. Well, this is a new technology, mostly to help continuous integration, cloud, but it's not about how the thing looks, it's about um, how you implement it. And then there's one down here, which is less system level awareness, less aware and event driven, more aware and event driven. I don't even know what that means. Um, so if anyone could explain that to me, um, system level awareness, I, I would argue that if you're building a microservice and it's aware of the entire system, that's probably not a good thing. Um, so anyway, I don't know what this one means. This one we'll talk about. The other thing I took them through was 12 factor apps. If you look, this is again, mostly about how you build the code. One code base, tracked and revision control, um, you know, uh, keep development, staging, and production, you know, as close as possible. It's development life cycle. So I'm trying to walk them through these things. And I came up with two other things that were a little interesting. One of them is how you deal with dependencies. And the second one was how you config. And the reason that I did the how you config thing is the other part of the project is I wanted to start teaching them that this needs to be multi-tenant. What does it mean to be multi-tenant? It's one code base, but two different universities have slightly different schema for student. Columbia's got a uni, which is you know, a Columbia unique thing, some schools don't. So I wanted them to understand the concept that you could have one code base that was surfacing out different schema for the same thing, the same resource, you know, depending on the tenant. And so what I said is, you've got to be able to modify this thing. So there's got to be a call that comes in here that says modify schema, extend schema, because I was getting them down the path of multi-tenant. And their default behavior, which wasn't necessarily wrong, was to do it via config file. So when everything started up, it read the schema, and that's what it did. So let's talk about some of these things. Composition and patterns. Microservices is about monolithic to micro. This is a simple commerce system. This is a monolith. I mean, no one would ever actually build it this way. This is not one gigantic JVM with one huge glass path. But you would never build it this way. But the net of it is you want to break it out into independent processes that are simple, focused, and connected to each other. Again, pretty straightforward. The problem is doing this leads to doing this, which leads to doing that. This is actually an application architecture diagram for a Fortune 500 company. The rectangles represent an application the colors represent the technology that they used, and these are the connections between them. So going from here to here seems appealing, but that leads to this, and it goes to there. So if you open a book on enterprise application design patterns, what are good patterns for enterprise application design, the very first thing isn't a good design pattern, it's don't do this. All right, so. 
you want to connect things through a hub. The second thing we learned is this hub's got to be active. It's not just switching things. You've got to reformat messages, route them, combine them. This hub is active. Why? Because if I plug this thing in and it starts sending messages, I may have to split it out. You have to do format, so it's not just protocol, it's not just the wires. The wires have different protocols, and the data types going across it are different. So you never want to do this, ever, because it leads to this. And so you want to basically have a hub. Now, the set, people used to say single point of failure won't scale. What's the value of middleware? And I would say the value of middleware is don't confuse logical and physical. Middleware gives you a simple logical abstraction. There's a single hub where you can put these things. It's distributed, scalable. That's physically, you want simple logical, and middleware adds scalable HA, so you don't need to think about it. And you're not the first person to deal with this. There's patterns all over the place. So I came up with a new theorem. These are the microservice characteristics, componentization via services uh, and smart endpoints with dumb pipes. These are the tenants of REST, layered system. My first theorem on microservices and REST are if you take componentization via services and smart endpoints and dumb pipes and you add layered systems, you wind up with an enterprise service bus. Right. This is a layered system. These pipes can be dumb. Right. But this itself is a microservice that's doing the layering. And you can make these things compatible. So you can follow these two paradigms, but you should not draw the conclusion that you don't need an enterprise service bus. And this goes even more broadly. There are basically, if you're going to compose microservices, there are basically three composition patterns. One of them is control flow. These are things like BP BPMN, BPEL. You want to go ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. Second one is data flow. This would be, this is from Boomi, but you would do similar things with uh, WSO2 ESB. Message comes in, you route it, switch it. And the third one is structure. Um, Tosca would be a diagram of this. So this is control flow, this is data on message flow, and this is what's connected to what. Well, this one we kind of touched on, and this one I'm not going to go into. The diagrams are always node and arcs, and these are the various forms, but the net of it is you want, you just don't want a hub, you want it to be active because it's adding value. And the value that it's often adding is either this or that, and so you need to think about microservices as a layer system, but a very specific type of microservice that's doing a very specific type of value, and because you have polyglot programming and polyglot persistence, you may not be slinging in a node, you may be doing it in some higher layer abstraction. So now, back to dependencies. Martin Fowler, brilliant guy, standard diagram. I, I tell the students, look, I'm not going to assign anything to you where you can't Google it and find code that almost works. The downs, you know, so that, that's okay. But what I'm going to do is I'm not going to teach you anything that somebody hasn't done a slide before. So I'm just going to go capture all the slides off the web. If you're using code, I get to reuse PowerPoint. <laughs> you're going to connect these things together. So you've got usually split into similar kinds of modules. Okay. And microservice work together as a system to provide business valuable features. You get three microservices, external services, blah, 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 blah. It's pretty straightforward. But think about this for a second. That sounds good, but in the example that I gave them, they didn't write the code. They had a binary. It was in a different life cycle. They bought it from somebody. You didn't write the code, and you don't have the source. You don't have it for all the microservices. You're trying to put together things where you don't control the code. OK, well, you can probably figure out what the APIs are, because you know most microservices, you can kind of go in and ping it with REST. You can go in a road, you know, um, what is the thing, Roadrunner or whatever. You can go sort of take it for a test drive and figure out. Some of them have a default website, browsable UI. 
You can figure out what libraries this thing uses because it's got a POM XML, it's got some kind of YAML file, it's got you know, Docker pulling things in. But you're going to have no idea what other REST APIs it calls. Because you don't pull in libraries to do this. The only library you pull in is the I want to make a REST call library, and they all have that. So if this is the commerce system, how do I know it's going to call the credit checking? There's no way to look at it and know that. So you can sort of figure out the ins, but you have no way of figuring out what these arrows are, what it's going to call, what its dependencies are. This makes assembly extremely difficult. So you can assemble this if you have overall understanding of how the pieces are coming together, but if you don't control some of this, it's very hard to actually figure out what the dependencies are. We, we dealt with this properly a couple of times. Uh, the one that most people are familiar with is uh, message exchange patterns in WSDL. It had two patterns that took some explaining, solicit response and uh, notification. It basically had out, in. So we had in, out, and in, and then we had out, in, and out. Why did we do that? It documented what you required. So if you were going to do assembly, possibly using a higher layer abstraction, you knew what the dependencies were. Service component architecture took this to the next step. You would publish services you exported. You would publish services you referenced. You would be able to set the properties. There was a way to package it, and then you put the implementation in, and it gave you an assembly model um, without actually going in and understanding the code. So the summary on this is dependency management is a crucial element of both microservices and 12-factor apps. We've done a pretty good job of documenting, because microservices and to some extent 12-factor apps focus on continuous integration, development, build, of documenting the dependencies, POM XML, runtime specific metadata, and also treating the backing services as attached resources. But it's the nature of REST API assembly that the API resource on microservice manages is pretty clear, but what it requires is very, very unclear, and it makes some composition scenarios extremely difficult. So it's very hard to wire these two services into the broker because you couldn't really document what they depended on. And so I think the thing we lost that we need to fix, this actually came up uh, around composite apps when the Kubernetes speaker was talking, is we've lost the out in and the out, and we're going to need to go back and figure that out. Final one was config in the environment. Now, you have to remember, I wanted them to be able to start building multi-tenant code, so they needed to be able to modify the schema. The third aspect of 12-factor apps is configuration. Apps config is everything that's likely to vary between deploys. All right, pretty good. This includes all of this stuff. You store it, it's temp, people store this in constants in the code, this is bad. Now, I mean, I learned that this was bad in Programming 101, but yeah, this is bad. Um, definition of config does not include internal application config stuff, such as routes, etc. 12 factor app stores config and environment variables that you read from a config file. Well, okay. Well. This approach works if you only have one config, if a deployment equals configuration. Every time you deploy, it's a new config. Or every, but it breaks down if I'm starting up new, slightly different instances of the same deployment. So I've deployed this thing up into an infrastructure, and I want to spin another one up. Well, what am I going to do? Go up and, and you know, remote edit the config file? Right? I'm going to have a bunch of config files in one deployment. Or you need to modify a running instance. Now, why would you do such a crazy thing? Well, think about SaaS. One model for delivering SaaS is an instance per tenant. I've deployed the app once, but each one is different. So every time a tenant comes on, it gets a new deploy. I can't go up and start editing config files. There's got to be a way to programmatically tailor that thing. And moreover, in SaaS, the tenant goes in and does this, not the deployer. When I sign up for Salesforce, the guy in Salesforce doesn't go in and edit the config file. Right? I'm doing it, or somebody in my company's doing it. So configuration has to be an API that allows you to do some tailoring of application logic 
resource models, et cetera. So it can't be a config file. It is a special kind of REST API that a well-defined microservice supports. And if you take a step back and you think about a multi-tenant SaaS application, it's really two applications. There's a data model that's modifiable, and then there's metadata that kind of controls the behavior of the code. So a valid shopping cart differs from tenant to tenant. I need some simple rules about what's a valid shopping cart for my company. So there's data, and then there's metadata. The app reads the data and the metadata to implement, and people use that. But there is a second app that a different role does that comes in and configures this app for the tenant. And I'm going, to add, I'm going to add something to my customer definition that nobody else has. There's an app for doing that. And so the net of it is, the config, in pro the config is properties good. The problem is the process is only one set of environment variables. And reading it from a file, well, I mean, that, how, do you, how do you get somebody else to do that remotely? So to kind of summarize this, we've learned a lot. And there are two ways I think about this. Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it, or maybe I'm just an old guy. <laughs> now, I'm tempted to think it's actually this, because Mohan and I were at lunch yesterday, <laughs> and it looked remarkably like this. <laughs> he was going on and on about these snot-nosed kids in their NoSQL database, and I was going on and on about these whippersnappers and how they do SOA. So kind of summary and discussion, we can realize tremendous value from these new technologies, but we risk losing benefits that emerged in middleware and other things, interface and dependency, optimized composition, and we need to work to realize these. And one of the things, that, there are two things that realize these things. It is application design patterns and middleware that codifies the application design patterns. So. Um, that is what I think the message from this is, and I think that's part of the value of WSO2 is its application patterns and middleware uh, that realizes it, so it's not anything. <laughs>